people who will help us uh, uh, and also uh, Philip Bloom, of course. But before Philip Bloom uh, gets his time to talk about the camera, I will just take a minute to mention that we have uh, a campaign with Sony. Uh, with the camera. When you purchase the FX3 camera now, uh, you can also purchase lenses, really nice Gigi Master lenses, uh, and uh, you get 3000 Swedish crowns or Norwegian crowns uh, discount on each lens, and you can buy as many lenses you like for the, together with this uh, camera. So it's a really, really nice bundle uh, with Sony. So uh, I also want to take the opportunity to, uh, so after this event, you can uh, contact us uh, regarding uh, uh, email or call us to our, uh, our sales expert to talk about more about the camera or purchase the camera. So uh, don't hesitate to contact us regarding this. Uh, but let's see if we have... Uh, uh, Mr. Bloom uh, online. I can't see him right now. Mr. Bloom is online. He is. Okay, good. Uh, during this session, um, uh, please send in your questions to uh, to Philip uh, during uh, through the chat, and I think that Philip will uh, try to answer them as much as he can during the, the session, and. Uh, I think this will, will be really, really good. And um, Philip Blum, I'm, I'm really, really glad that you are joining us today. Uh, I know that you were visiting our stores a couple of years ago and uh, had some camera sessions there. And I know that they were really, really good. So I'm glad that you are with us digital and I hope that you will join us in our stores in the future when when it's safe to go out and travel again, but uh, this is a really yeah. nice way to, uh, to meet anyway. So I think that uh, from my side, I'm ready to, uh, to let you talk, Philip. Uh, okay. Tony? Yes. Maybe we should uh, tell the audience that if they have any questions, and I think Philip, he, 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 he's really good at that, please uh, put it in the chat box because uh, yes. Philip, you will read the questions uh, quarterly and then you will answer the questions, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you have questions whilst, I, whilst I'm actually talking, it makes sense. Uh, if I'm talking about something that you want me to um, elaborate on, it's better to talk about it then than after. I could, obviously, I could talk about it afterwards, but you might forget to ask a question by that point. So, um, um, so I mean, the, the I will be talking about, I have a keynote, which is like, 15 20 minutes long i'll be going through some other bits and pieces so there's a lot of time to answer questions so make sure you you use that time so perfect perfect so uh, then are we ready to launch yeah perfect okay it's your time now philip great hello so i'm in sweden right i uh yeah, wow. you're both in Sweden and Norway, to be honest. We, we have uh, both. Again? Norway. Yes, yes. You couldn't get no. enough of me yesterday, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Fair enough. You're in Scandinavia. <laughs> Scandinavian photo, you know. We, we are suited in Norway and in Sweden. but And we are uh, launching a store also in Copenhagen this year. So we, we are growing. Okay. Yes. yes. I, I was trying to figure out if I could get something like... Uh, an English background generated by Zoom, I couldn't work it out. So <laughs> um, I can certainly add strange things onto my face and things. I didn't realize that yesterday I had the touch up thing done on my face. So I fixed that. So not that you can see anything with Zoom anyway, but touch up my appearance was on there. And I was like, Ooh, no. don't want any of those filters. Thank you very much. Um, although I do actually have a filter on the lens, which is a, a Pro Mist 1 8th. It just it has a nice blooming effect on any little backlights and stuff. So there we go. But I'm not here to talk about lighting. I'm here to talk about a camera, which you need to imagine is in my hands right now because I don't have it. Uh, I had to give it back, I, um, which is a shame. 
I was really hoping to uh, of them to not take it back from me, but they did. Other other reviewers needed it, so yeah. So I just want to, so I am just want to make sure that I am on the main screen because I always I did this yesterday. I was never sure if I was on the main screen because at the moment it's not. So am I on the main screen being screen or not? I don't know. Uh, you can actually do this if uh, you guys out there, if you see all the uh, uh, pictures from the uh, webcams, you can yeah. just take your, your, your cursor to, um, um, to Philip Bloom and uh, okay. right click, right click with your mouse and they say pin. Then you can actually get a, a bigger um, screen of uh, Philip Bloom. I didn't even know that. There we go. I'm learning things. That's Me good. too. <laughs> I just learned this uh, today. <laughs> so when you right. pin Philip Bloom, then you actually get a, a bigger picture of Philip Bloom. Keep it small <laughs> so you can see everybody's lovely faces. Well, one, two, three, four. Not many. <laughs> Most people are understandably not uh, showing their faces. Uh, I have to, though. So there we go. So yeah, the, um, the FX3 was... Uh, uh, something that uh, I had for a couple of weeks and uh, was launched, well, I think three days ago, I believe. And I am going to do a presentation about it. Whilst I don't have physically have the camera here, um, I do have um, an A7S III here, which I can use for menus and stuff because it is all the same internals. So at least I have that and I can still talk about um, other bits and pieces from it like the I don't have the audio handle because that came with the thingy but I have the, the XLR KVM so I'll be able to talk about audio so I think my focus is on too slow let me just change that it's uh, auto focus let's make it three so that should be a little bit yeah yeah that's better there we go and I'll be talking about autofocus it's a nice little instruction to it. So I'm going to, I am going to try and live mix to my computer. And hopefully you can still hear me. Give me a thumbs up if you can still hear me over my computer screen. Perfect. Great. So, um, yeah, this is, a, this is a shot from my, I did a review, a 41 minute review somehow I managed to do, which I put out a couple of days ago. Um, and these are some of the shots from it. So this is the the uh, FX3 on that. So I just want to give you some background information about the camera. Um, has anybody, actually, I, I can't see a show of hands, but um, but put just in the chat, just say if you've ever used, uh, if you, you own an A7S3 or if you use an A7S3. So I just have that information. So, um, so just put it in the chat if you can, if you don't have a, because um, I can't see everybody's faces anyway. So it's just a good to know. Um, how many people have used an A7S3? Uh, so, it's, so it's one person who's used an A7S3. Okay, <laughs> that's fair enough. So anybody interested in potentially buying an A7S3 or looking at the FX3 and not sure which one to get, just chuck it in the chat as well, just so I know. It's, uh, it's good to have this information for myself so I, I can um, tailor my little talk um, to that. So, so um, the FX3 is part of the cinema line which started with the um venice which is on top there and then the uh fx9 and then the fx6 so the fx6 was the camera that launched the cinema line um but the other two cameras were already out so then i did actually i had an fx9 i did actually sell it um uh, a couple of months ago because i chose to get it keep to get an fx6 instead which was more practical for me being a lighter camera um for my type of work and my FX9 didn't have um, cinema line written across it because it wasn't a, such a thing at the time. So I had the pre-cinema line version, but it was the same thing. Um, but we'll talk about what each of these cameras are. Has anybody by any chance got a Venice? Used the Venice? I mean, I've never used the Venice. I've seen a Venice. I'm not talking about going to Venice. It's the name of the camera. Um, I have not used it, but it is a fantastic camera. It's um, really started to become a, um, a very much a popular camera feature films and high-end productions, which previously, if we, if we don't talk about film, because people are still shooting film, but not many, Ari with their Alexa cameras has definitely been the most popular camera for digital cinema. And then Red, 
and Sony have Sony actually made the very first digital cinema camera. And if anybody can answer in the chat and tell me the very first, you don't have to tell me the camera, but tell me the film that had the very first digital video in it. It wasn't shot entirely, but here's a clue. The second and third film of the trilogy were shot entirely digital using the Sony cinema cameras. Um, but that was a while ago with much smaller sensors. That was a two third inch sensor back then. And then they moved up to the F35, the F65, which is an incredible camera, but didn't take off for whatever reason. Um, and then the Venice. And I think when you work with, you know, director of photography is very much um, have their tools that they love. Um, also there's a, there's a split. There's, there's, there's director of photographers who, love, who will insist on using a particular tool. And there's ones who don't care. It's not about that. It's about the lighting. It's about everything else. Um, but the elect, what made the Alexa so good is the image looked so much like film. The, the colors looked like film. The dynamic range was like film. And but it was more sensitive. And they, and they loved that. And so the Venice came along and had beautiful colors, which was one of the key things. Beautiful colors. It was better in low light. It's better in low light than um, the Alexa. It's a very powerful camera and it's become very, very popular. And this is really important because what Sony have done is they've taken that beautiful color and they have, it's actually been um, used in actually the very first camera. And again, if you can, you know, the Star Wars episode one, somebody did get it in there. Well done, Star Wars episode one. The, um, does anybody know the, cam the first camera that Sony put in Venice colors into? Does anybody know? I'll be very interested if you can guess the first camera. So as a clue, it was a Mark II of a camera. And one of the features that they put in it was the Venice color science. So when we know the Sony cameras, um, if you work for Sony, you cannot answer this question because that's cheating. If you do work for Sony and you don't know this answer, then shame on you, you should know this. Um, <laughs> so um but the first oh it's it's so close somebody got it so close take that fs7 and subtract two from it and you'll be there so that's the camera it was the fs5 mark ii was the first camera to have the color science from the sony venice and then the fx9 came along and that i first, I first used that in september of I think it was about September, about two decades ago. That's how it feels now. But I think it officially it was 2019. But it feels like a very, 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 very long time ago. And what this camera uh, was very special, what made it special was it was Sony's first, um, well, apart from the Venice, full frame and 65. It was their first broadcast camera, you know, first TV camera, first professional camera that people could use because the difference between that and that so if you look at the venice all these controls are on the other side of the camera from the operator so this is this is um the assistant size this is where your first assistant would do all their settings and stuff they're pulling focus and they're changing all of the settings on the camera so on the other side the camera operator can do some minor some minor changes bits in there but to go deeper into the menu they have to go to the other side of the camera hence this is a not a single camera, single person uh, camera, not a single operator camera. Whereas this is, all the controls are on the operator side. The only stuff that is on the other side are, well, very little, some connections basically, and a fan, not a lot on there. So this was the first camera that Sony brought out that had not just um, a full frame, but it also had uh, has the Venice color science and autofocus which is quite a big thing um and i know a lot of people a lot of professionals very much um are very snobby about autofocus um and that's simply because they haven't used autofocus in a way that actually works um a lot of cameras have autofocus my very first camera has all had autofocus i don't have it now it's, we're talking like 34 years ago and it obviously wasn't very good. And it's only in the last, so it's one of my cats, in the last 
if we go with Sony years, in the last five years, Sony have gotten better and better with, with video autofocus. Um, Canon were the first to bring phase detection autofocus to a camera, and that camera was the uh, 70D, whenever that was, a long time ago, uh, six, seven years ago. But this is, but they've had video autofocus in their cameras. The first one was the C100, but it was a little square. The C300 Mark II was their first one that had it in a usable way. And it's taken Sony a long time to bring it in. And it's something that I've been wanting to see for quite a while. Um, the stills cameras have had it for ages. The first, the first really good one, uh, Alpha series camera that had it was the A7R Mark II. Had very good autofocus compared to what we have now. No, but it's phase detection autofocus. So, but it's really just Canon and Sony that have really good autofocus, and Sony are getting better and better. And now I would say that they are the leading manufacturer who make cameras that have for autofocus. It is just superb. Other brands use contrast-based autofocus, um, and it's it's not good because the way that autofocus works. Anyway, I'll go on to that when I talk about autofocus, but it, is a, it was a huge feature for me to have this in there. And it's not something they use all the time though. It's, it's, it's an, an, uh, you use it for certain situations. The previous camera, the FS7, you didn't, I never used it. So this was, for me, it was a big deal. This was a big deal. The fact it had a dual base ISO was a big deal to me. So you, you could, when you had a lot of light, you can shoot in a lower ISO. And if you have, uh, you're in lower light situation, then you can change to a higher base ISO. Because every normally cameras are just rated as a single ISO, um, which is generally 100 or whatever, um, depending on the camera. And this has two. And that was very, very useful. So this very powerful camera, 6K sensor, which is um, what's called oversampled. So they they take that 6K and they put it, they scale it down to 4K with the perfect mathematics, creating a higher quality 4K image. So a very special camera. And then they they shrunk it um, massively with the FX6. And when I first saw this, I was like, oh my god! And then I picked it up and like, wow! My back says this is a lovely camera um, because whilst the FX9 no, the Venice is heavy. Whoops, that's heavy. That's much lighter, but still heavy once you put stuff on it. And this, well, depending on what you got on it, is is a very very light camera, but still, but interestingly, had way more features, video features. I mean, frame rates and and stuff than the FX9, which is very interesting because a lot of what was you this was actually made by alpha division designed by alpha division so a lot of what's in the a7s3 is in this camera it still operates like an fx9 but it was quite and i think that's kind of why i, I liked it so much because of all the features that it had and that brings us on to an even smaller camera um and this is the obviously the fx3 and this is also based upon the A7S3, um, much more so than the FX6. The FX6 has the innards in a way of the, well, not completely, but it had the, um, has all the frame rates and et cetera, et cetera, of the, and the same sensor of the A7S3. But this is very, very, very similar. What it doesn't have it, that both this and this have is the variable ND, and it's simply not possible to put it into this camera when it has, well, there's two things that stops it. And I know a lot of people wanted it when it was announced. If you don't know what variable ND is, normally with ND for, um, for cameras that we that are in video cameras, it's a, normally a filter wheel, um, or it will be a, an up and down button to cycle through fixed sets of ND. So it'll be like, generally like two stops of ND per, per wheel. Um, which means it's not fine, you know, if you need to stop, you know, finding it's a little bit dark and you just want to add a little bit more light and you don't want to push up the ISO because that's not a way you want to, what you want to do is optically and that means either the lens or ND or shutter, which you don't really want to touch. And so you can't do that, but with the variable ND, you can literally fine tune it to exactly what you want. And the first camera to get that was the um, FS5. And we don't have it in any of the alpha cameras. 
Um, and a big part of that is down to the size. Um, it needs to have more space and also IBIS in um, where we have uh, the sensor, sensor is moved, uh, stabilized internally. To have that and available ND, there's just simply not enough space to make it happen. So there's the lineup, as you can see. I don't know if anybody's got them all. Um, that will be very impressive if somebody's got them all. I, I, I am um, a camera hoarder, but I don't have them all. I've only got one of those. So I've, I've sold uh, one of them already. Um, but somebody's saying, yeah, it's the first time you can use autofocus for film. I mean, absolutely. I mean, we'll talk a little bit more about autofocus in a bit, but it's the A7S III, uh, sorry, the FX3 has even better autofocus. So this is just some footage that I shot. Um, nothing particularly fancy, it's just near where I live. I was hoping for better snow than that, um, but it hasn't happened this year. But this is shot in 100 frames per second in 4K. So these shots are with the 135 f 1.8 GM. This is the uh, Suri 50 millimeter and 35 millimeter anamorphic lenses. 35, um, they are um, manual lenses. And they actually are not full frame, which is, um, which is interesting because if you ever use any of like the a7r4, the a7 III, um, those sort of cameras and then in the FX, the FX9 and the FS7, um, they all have a Super 35 mm mode. So it's a way of sampling, instead of having, um, actually no, not the FS7, the FX9, they have a Super 35 mm mode. So you can go from full frame to Super 35. So it's instead of, um, it's just mathematically, it's still 4K, but it's tighter, 1.5 times tighter. So a lot of late, le le most movies, were shot super in the film is super 35 on the most part unless it says so like 70 millimeter and so most lenses are designed for super 35 and so it's a very important um for a lot of people to have super 35 but we don't have it on the um on cameras which don't have so the a7s3 the fx6 and the fx3 do not have that ability to there's simply not enough pixels. What I can do is I, I mean, I try not to ruin this. Here we go. So this is clear image zoom. So it's a digital zoom combined with upscaling. So it's not just cropping the sensor as you, well, as you digitally zoom in, it calculates new pixels to create it. So you're able to have um, a one point, you're able to have super 35 whilst um, in there does kill the the autofocus still works but it just kills the tracking but when you're using on a manual lens like an anamorphic it doesn't matter um so that's let me just take that off there there we go so that's um how you saw on those that footage of the um of the anamorphic stuff so you can still use oops there we go um super 35 mm lenses on the camera which is important to a lot of people so this is obviously the a7s3 um, I don't know why they insist on not putting the three on the front. If I'm buying a new camera and spending that much money on it, I want people to know. I, that's not the two. That's the three I've got, everybody. They hide it at the back of the camera. It's like, come on, guys. I want to show my label off. It's like people who buy a Leica without the red dot. Why are you doing that? You've got a Leica. Have the red dot on it. Wear a Leica t-shirt. Have a Leica baseball cap on at the same time. Let people know. <laughs> But anyway, this is an absolutely brilliant camera that um, took a long time to come out. The previous model came out in uh, 2015. So it was, um, and, the, and the pre then the very first generation came out in 2014. So there was like a year gap between the two models. And then there was a five year gap between this one. So it's very much anticipated and it didn't let people down because it, it um, what was interesting, so I had, um, so uh, the person I would deal with at Sony came over to my house um, with the camera for me to test. And I was going to, uh, I, I made the launch film, the European launch film. And I didn't know what the camera did. You have Sony Alpha rumors and you have all of these things and you're like, you know, who knows if that's actually true. Some of them sounded believable, some of them didn't. And then 
he went through a keynote and he just went through all of the specs. I was expecting it to be 4K up to 60p with 10 bit internal recording. I would have been happy. I'd have been happy with that. And then he started going through the things. So, so it's 4K up to 120p. I'm like, really? So, but obviously it kills the autofocus and it does that. And he went, nope. What, what, what is the caveat here? What is, what happened? There must be something that actually, you know, there's got to be a downside to it. Went, nope. Oh, there's a 1.1 times crop when you go into that, but that's it. But everything else is full frame. I'm like, so every mode is 10 bit. But he went, yep. I went, okay. And autofocus works in every single frame rate. I went, yep. I'm like, okay. And then he went, and it does a uh, 16 bit raw output. I'm like, what? Um, so it was, it was a bit of a shock, everything that it did. And, but a good shock, because, you know, it's like, I mean, it's crazy. You know, it's, I don't know what, what, how much it is in Sweden, but to have a camera, and this is what, you know, it's, it's people saying, oh, it's an expensive camera. And if you look at it in still photography terms, yes, it is. But in video camera terms, no, it's not. It really isn't. It's very cheap. It's, uh, it's about two and a half thousand pounds cheaper than the um, FX6 is and way less than half the price of the FX9. Incredible features on this camera. So as you can see, they are, um, they're very similar, but they aren't the same camera. There are some differences, but the, the insides are very much the same. The design is much nicer for sure. Um, as much, you know, I love my A7S III, but I do feel like Sony need to redesign their Alpha series. Um, it will be nice to see, you know, it'd be nice to see a, a slightly more softer, rounder design. I, I've got the, um, just bent down to get that. You can't see it's in a cage, but I've got the Alpha One here, which um, you can't see the camera at all. But uh, this is a stunning and astonishing camera, but um, it's still the same very angular design that we've seen for a while. And I've been wanting uh, something different, um, more modern. And this FX3 is a really beautiful camera, but it's still very much in the same um, style as a mirrorless camera. And I will show you that here. So let me just see if there's anything on the questions. There we go. Oh yeah, there's um, somebody saying the Super 35 mil in HD. But uh, yeah, I'll get to that when I get to the features. But if you want to shoot 4K, uh, you want, there is no 4K, there is Super 35. So this is the top. So what they've done is they have, sadly for me, removed the EVF and I love the EVF, but there's a reason they did it. So it's, it's, it keeps in line with the other cameras and it gives us this lovely flat top with mounting points and very, very video centric controls, as you can see. So we have um, a big record button on there, we, which, um, which lights up. We have um, shortcut buttons for white balance and ISO. Um, on the A7S III, we, if I can show you here, I don't know if you can see, oh, probably not, hang on, let me get there. So it's probably a little bit dark and to get it into the light. So there is um, one, there's a record button here and there's a shortcut button there. I should have had that in the slide, it would have been easier. And you can also change those, but it's, re I don't really care about the ISO button being up there because I put the ISO uh, control on the, my rear dial at the back. But the white balance button up there is really good to have. You can change it while you're shooting. And what is very interesting is if you look at the, um, the hand grip, you can see <clears throat> there's a W and a T there. So if you've used the alphas before, normally that's where you have your on off switch. So this is for the uh, for zoom. So, so the FX6 has a zoom rocker. So does the FX9. It's on it's on the hand grip on the other side. Um, the thing is, it, this will only work with a servo zoom. It won't work with a mechanical zoom. You know, like a 2470, etc. Because that requires you to physically turn the um, physically turn the lens to zoom. So a servo zoom is um, it's electronic, and you can you use the zoom rocker. You can still manually you can still do the turning of the zoom, but it is a fully electronic lens. And there is full frame wise, there's only two that at the moment that I know of. I have one of them, and that's the twenty eight to one three five f four, which is the big 
one. <coughs> Excuse me. And then there's the new 16 to 35 C and that, so they have servo zooms, but you can still use the zoom for that clear image zoom that I showed you. And that is very useful to have that on there. So you can, you know, it's having that clear image zoom is so handy when you're, you know, you, you've got a nice shot and you're like, oh, cause we, look with photographs, we can always crop, even with it's, you know, we can crop a little bit, high megapixels, we can certainly crop. But to, you are going to, if you're gonna crop a photograph on the A7S III, um, then it's going, you're gonna lose resolution. But the way that works in video is you can essentially crop without losing resolution. So it's actually a very useful feature to have on there. And you can change the speed of it to how fast or slow you want it to be. Um, so yeah, that's that. And that's the top there. So let me move to the next slide. So this is the um, XLR handle. Um, it screws in to the two uh, quarter twenties either side of the MI shoe connector. So it slots into the MI shoe connector and then screws in. It, you know, it is not sold separately by Sony. Um, I know a lot of people have been saying, oh, I want this for my A7S III. Well, you don't, because whilst it can physically connect to the MI shoe, it cannot screw in because there's no screw points. And even if you had a cage, it wouldn't screw in because of the way that the, the A7S III is designed. I can show you here um, on the top here. So there is, also we have the mode dial uh, on one side and then we also we also have a it's a, a night we have a big gap so it can't actually screw in and even if you put a cage on it because of the way the width of the evf uh it would mean the quarter 20 would be so close to that that i don't think they could physically machine it so even if they did sell it separately it would not be any good um so as i said before this is based upon the uh the case the, the XLR K3M add-on here, well, it's because it's on face autofocus. Unless I hide my face, then I, it won't do that. So I actually can turn off face tracking just briefly. There we go. So now, even if I put it here, it should focus on it. The magic of autofocus. So if you have it on face, it will always, if you see the eye, then, so this is useful. It's still very good but I can also change the zone as well, how much, but that's another thing. So this is a very, very good device. So this has two uh, XLR inputs, which are also quarter inch um, TRS jacks. If for some reason you are using those connections, I don't know anybody who is, but X locking XLR connections, professional audio connections. And we can have phantom power um, on there. So, um, and line, and mic level. So phantom power is for certain microphones that need um, 48 volts to operate. And also will drain your internal battery of the, the, not the, internal, the FZ100 battery, but um, it's there. Um, and it's, it has, doesn't drain it too much, but having professional connections, because otherwise we just have on the camera, if we look at the slide again, uh, all the other cameras that we have, I just got that, um, the mic input, same the A7S III, et cetera, et cetera. Let me see if I can zoom in on this there. Oop, almost. Wait. So the, oh, I've gone to a different slide. Sorry, there we go. So the red is the mic input. Um, and below that's the headphone jack. Actually, while we're on there, we have um, um, full size HDMI and the bot, we have a USB-C for power delivery and connecting a computer and a micro um, USB, but anyway. That's for controllers. So what is so cool about this is it's so solid, the connection onto the camera. So these, these are fantastic, but it's connected via the MI shoe. So it's, it, it's got little fine connectors on there and it is something that you'll be like, you're worried about. And you never want to pick your camera up via the, the, the XLR K3M because eventually, it'll stop working because you'll start bending the metal. And that's another reason why you'd never want to use that handle on anything else that doesn't screw in. 
Um, but what you can do with this, if you are interested in this device, it does come with a relocating cable. So if you have a cage, you can um, connect, you can have this over, oops, let me hold it with the other hand. You could have it on the side and still have a physical handle there with using a cable to connect it. So, but you don't need that with the, you don't need that with this because it physically connects. So we also have another input, which is input three, which is there. And that is a, a 3.5 millimeter input. So you could use that for, yeah, if you wanted to connect up a, uh, like a road wireless go or any sort of microphone that is that sort of connector now i actually use this for something else you can see it on the top of my camera and that is a time code box tentacle sync and i connect up where is it i connect it up into channel into this input so this is channel three and four so stereo input, I still have channels one and two because on the newer codecs on the camera, which we'll get onto in a minute, has four channels of audio, which is really important. So what this time code box has, because unfortunately FX3 does not have time code, which is a lot of people would want that. I would like to have had that. So if you're using multiple cameras, it makes it so much easier to sync it up in post. But using an app, um, it'll, it'll you'll set your, your, your time code for time of day and you could say have another one here which would connect up to say your fx9 or fx6 which goes into your time code uh, in um, of your camera and so your these they both be sending the same time code into each camera and whilst it won't display on your camera it will be recording it as a audio track on channels on channel four it will be at you put it into their software, um, all your clips, and it syncs up in about five seconds. And then you export an XML. It's the most easy way to sync up multiple cameras. It's an absolute joy. So having this and still having your two inputs for audio is absolutely wonderful. So that's the downside of using something like one of these on a camera without an XLR box is you are taking up your 3.5 millimeter input. You can use splitter cables and stuff, but it starts getting really messy with them. So very nice feature to have that. So I love the, the this, I recommend this box to everybody who shoots video with the Sony series, but to have it actually as part of the camera is, is really good. And it is very, very solid. Um, you do actually have a switch on there. Um, which you can turn off is handle audio on and off. So if you don't want to use the XLRs and you want to just use the 3.5 millimeter for whatever reason, I don't know, um, you could. It doesn't make much sense to me because if you do want to just use a 3.5 millimeter input, on top of the handle, you've got um, two quarter 20 holes, I think, and then there's one on the back. So you could add a second cold shoe, add, have a cold shoe on there if you wanted to. So if you wanted to use like a road wireless go or anything else like that, and the three the mic input three uh, the, the channels three and four you can, and you can also set different channels to replicate, and you can set the input three and four to be channels one and two. It's a terrific device, it really is. So that's uh, one of the biggest differences by far. And oh yeah, we have um, then the connections headphones. The yeah, the full size HDMI. So we do have another connect. We do have another quarter twenty on the top above the HDMI. It's not enormously useful for you can't mount anything on it because it will block the port because it's obviously so close. But what you can use it for is an HDMI clamp, which is a really sensible thing to do. So it doesn't come with it, but you could buy something from small small rig do generic HDMI clamps, and it will screw in there and hold your HDMI plug in solidly which you really want to do because that's the downside of um, using an hdmi connector is it's so easy to just pull out i actually just have this little connector on here which just loops so it it won't come out um, and keeps the cable nice but uh, it's definitely worth you really need to protect your hdmi ports um, 
because if you you know you damn if you hit it you know push it really hard especially with a really chunky cable like i i would actually recommend using a right angle adapter so you have got less chance of damaging the port but um yeah it'd be great to have sdi on this camera but it's just they've packed so much onto this into this camera that it is just very very it would have, it would have had to be a bigger camera than it is and they've already the fx6 has already exists so we already have that um, if you want a bigger camera with the professional connections, it exists, and it's not that much more. So this is the rear of the camera. As you can see, we have more shortcut buttons. There's somebody at the door, but they're going to have to wait. Um, they can leave it by the there. Um, so we have on here, we have, you can see they're marked on the shortcut buttons. We have peaking, zebra, shutter, and display. Um, I don't know why we have a shutter shortcut button on there it makes no sense to me whatsoever because we still have our two dials on the, we have our front dial and our rear dial which you can use for the aperture or the shutter so i don't really know what's the point of that um but it's there if for, for what so basically you will press that shutter that so that rear dial is a um uh in it, it's it's it turns it's so i use that for iso but you can use it for anything you want so let me see what these questions are tentacle sync there we go how's the lcd screen same as the fx6 so uh the lcd screen is the same as the um a7s3 so it's actually uh, it's smaller i think it's slightly smaller than the fx6 screen but it's it's it's, it's a much better touch screen it's much more sensitive the fx6 touchability is quite uh, you need to be quite firm with it so it's a it's a different screen um can a histogram the histogram can only sh the histogram is exactly the same as a7 s3 it just shows luminance on there as well so and can you lock the wheel you don't need to lock well the wheel is actually quite hard to turn you, you highly unlikely it, it's fiddly um by default it unless you've pressed one of those buttons like shutter, it won't do anything if you turn it. If you just leave the ISO uh, shortcut on the top of the camera and just use that dial, it's just a way of cycling through. If nothing is selected, then nothing can actually be done. So to, to demonstrate that, I will show you using my A7S III. So um, I am, if I press, so right now I'm just, you can't see me, like that, but you can see I'm, I'm actually turning the dial right now, so it's it's selecting it because that's how I've done it. But if it was, uh, so as you can see right now, the ISO is white. So if you try turning the dial, if you haven't have set, set up as a shortcut like I have, then that will will do nothing. It it needs to be told what to do, otherwise it won't do anything. It is um, a you know, if you look at the actual camera of the A7S III, it actually has the ISO shortcut is here. So I'm actually quite lazy. I, you know, I, I should really just l not have it automatically on there and press a button and then turn it. But it's just how I use the camera. Um, so yeah, so that's the, and what else have we got on there? The focus magnification, oh, the mode. So the A7S III used to have, or hat still doesn't, hasn't gone. It has a uh, mode dial for selecting between the different modes. Um, the two video main video modes are obviously going to be video and S and Q. So S and Q is for slow motion, which I'll get into in a minute. But the camera is st it's still a stills camera. It still has all the same stills capability as the A7S III. So if you want to change into stills mode, you'd press the mode button and then you'd cycle through to um, choose what you want. So it just frees up that space on the top of the camera. So that's why you have that big record button space there. And they've moved the dial up there. I'm not sure if I like the dial up there. It's not a natural place for me, but what I, what I, what I found, which was quite interesting was, so when you are shooting with an EVF, your hand is you know, on, the, on the grip normally like this, right? So, but when you're using an LCD screen, what's interesting is you kind of shift your grip up because um, uh, you're shooting lower. And, and so you actually, your hand moves up. And so your thumb na naturally rests on the top when you are shooting using an LCD screen because 
it is, and you don't have an EVF, so naturally you are going to be using the LCD screen. So you will you will be shooting lower without question because if you it is quite hard to shoot like this because it's heavier the moment you hold a camera up it becomes heavy so that's one of the downsides of not having an evf is you will be shooting lower but that's okay because all scandinavian people are seven foot and so it's okay for filming average people like me who are a paltry six foot two but for short people um, like Americans and stuff, um, they, you know, they're going to be shooting much lower. I do like shooting up high. You can, of course, um, build up rigs. I saw a video uh, on YouTube yesterday where they built up the FX3 to the point where you cannot see the camera anymore. It had all loads of cinema stuff on it. So it's, it's a base that you can use to build stuff up onto. So, um, Anything else on the back? No, what, any of these questions? So the display is exactly the same as the A7S3. Uh, the A7S3 has RGB histogram. Does it? Well, I've, I've never seen my histogram that I have um, on mine. Okay, the missing. So that, Oops, there. I have not seen. I've I've never seen an RGB histogram, and if it if you can show me, then I'll be very happy because, as far as I know, it's only luminance, which is here. There's no waveform either, so we have that in the FX6 and the FX9. We do not have waveform on here, so that is a shame. But um, I have not seen an RGB um, histogram. If you can show me where it is, then that will be cool. So I don't think there's much more on the back there. The shortcut button number four, um, you can basically set them for anything you want. What I have done um, when I was using this camera, I set the center button of the dial, which is by default nothing, um, to focus magnification. So you can, you know, if you're not to focus, you are trusting it, but you can double check it on there. But on manual focus, you really want to use that. I know it has a function button at the top here saying focus mag, but I'm a rebel and I changed it and I still left the writing on there. I didn't put any gaffer tape on it to hide it. I use that as focus hold. So when you're using autofocus and you want, you know, somebody's walking towards you, for example, and the camera's tracking them and what you want is let me see if I can actually demonstrate that so it's going to show you how messy it is so right now I'm on autofocus if I go out of frame then it's going to default onto the background when it's tracking somebody it's gone onto my chair because it's not in face tracking but when you so right now if I press so I got, it's tracking me right now so I press this button here which is actually I've set it to autofocus on and off so now it's the same sort of thing. The difference between focus hold and autofocus on and off is focus hold, as soon as you let go of it, it goes back into autofocus. But this is actually on autofocus on and off. So if somebody is, you're tracking somebody and they exit the frame, or maybe you just want to stop the autofocus and working at that point, you you know, want, because we don't always want things to be perfectly in focus. Sometimes you want them to just go out. You hold it down and that. So a lot of lenses actually do have a button on the side here from Sony, which is by default set to focus hold. But to be honest with you, um, I don't, the only time I'd ever use it would be handheld because when you're shooting on a tripod, you don't want to be pressing a button because you're going to be move. You get, you're basically moving the lens by doing that. You know, you're pushing the lens. Um, so just, I just have button on the back here and on the, FX3, I've put that as five. I mean, you could also put it on one because I don't use it for any, I don't use one at all, or I could use it for three. So you have the options, but having a focus hold button or a button to turn off autofocus is really important when using autofocus. Okay, uh, any other thing is here? So the other big difference is the fan. So we now have an active cooling system um, for the camera. So this doesn't is not hugely important to, to cold countries, 
uh, like you guys and here, but um, I, I, the only time I've ever had any overheating with the A7S III was when I was doing some overheating tests and I had a heat lamp on it and I was shooting in 120p and kept rolling. And it just, and it, I think it got to let maybe, depending on the temperature, the highest I actually had it is, which is 50 degrees, which is above the operating temperature that, that you should have the camera anyway. And it went for like half an hour. At normal room temperature, it went for like an hour and a half. One key thing you should do though, if you are ever shooting in, even with the FX3, is just make sure your screen is not onto the body even with the active cooling system. So just by having this on the ASAP Nestor, just, just by turning, taking your screen away from it, it lets your camera roll a lot longer. And I found that with, I could still get the, the FX3 to overheat in when the heat lamp was strong, um, if the screen was against the body. So, but if it isn't, you can keep on going. It won't stop, it'll keep on recording for as long as you want to record 100, 120p for, what, for whatever strange reason, you don't really need to. Um, oh yeah, the, the other thing that's different, same as the A7S III, but uh, if you don't know about it already, is it does dual slot recording um, and you can do simultaneous recording and it uses, you can use two different types of media. Look how good that autofocus is. So that, is I haven't done my nails. I need to, the manicure place is closed. What am I supposed to do? Um, but there is the compact flash type A card. Um, they're still quite expensive, unfortunately. So it's actually focusing on my, um, let me hold it like that. There we go. So the two different capacities this is the larger one. And these are fast, fast cards. They're not as fast as say, let me see what I've got here. I've got loads of cards kicking around. So this is the compact flash type B card, um, which is faster because it's twice the size. So it's, it's got um, the bus is quicker, but this is very fast. Um, for video, there's only a couple of modes which need it, um, but you can shoot in every frame rates using SD cards. Um, so I don't have any Sony SD cards. This is an Angel Bird one. This is a V90. So the cards that you'd be, you know, you can use v, V30 for basic codecs, V60 for better codecs, V90 for your higher quality codecs, and then for your higher frame rates and the best codecs, you use these. And what's interesting is um, like the A9 also has that same dual slot and you would use the faster cards um, because you can shoot 30 frames a second. And what I really love about using these faster cards in that camera, then if you've ever used an A7R4, or even an A7 III, you don't get it with the A7S II III or the FX III, is when you're taking a lot of photographs, the buffer fills up and it needs to write to the card. So depending on how fast your card is, you can't shoot video until that buffer's filled. But with the A9 and you, with the new cards, no matter how many frames you're taking, photographs you're taking, you hit record, it'll instantly go into record mode, which is fantastic. So these cards are great. Um, as soon as other manufacturers come and start making them, then the Sony prices will drop. So right now, because they're the only ones you can get, um, they are expensive. You don't need them, but they they are the fastest ones. And of course it means you can offload quicker. And clearly this camera is designed for vloggers because it has a front record button. So you don't have to reach up onto the top of the camera to record, you can just, there. Um, I don't know if it's, it's not obviously made for vloggers, but it's there. So what's the boot up time for the FX3? I think it's about one second. It's literally turn it on, boom, it's, it's on. No, there's no boom, it doesn't do that. Um, I've got red Komodo, it takes about uh, like a minute, 45 seconds to a minute to turn on, nightmare. So, um, but I'll go through the, when I go through the menus, I will show you the different codecs and which ones need the specific cards. But the front record button is, is nice to have. And if you, you know, I'm not talking about vlogging, but there's times when you are, uh, you actually, it's a very, it's nice and practical to actually have it on there. So, you know, shooting at a particular angle, you know, it's on the tripod. Maybe you're doing, you're filming interviews, for example, you're the interviewer, um, rather than having to reach up to hit the record button, the camera's just there press the record button. So it's, it's a useful thing to actually have. 
and it also has tally lights. So um, a lot of them, we have also the red, um, we have the red ring uh, of the record button, which is great. Um, and we have a tally light at the front. These can be turned off. So my, in my, you know, going back to my news days, I never had a tally light on because I never wanted people to know I was recording, but uh, it's very useful to have. We have on the back a very big one um, above uh, in the center. And we can also in the menu set the border to be red. So there is no way you can be shooting and not realize that you're not recording. There's no way it's not possible. With the F, you know, with um, the A9, I could easily know. I could easily not know I'm recording because especially there's no flip out screen. I have no way, there's no tally light or anything like that. <clears throat> and if you're using an A7S III, unless you have that screen flipped out or whatever, you're not gonna know you're recording if you're at the front. So it's really nice to have all these tally lights and it's really nice that you can turn them off which is really important. Um, somebody's asking for the same batteries. Yes, it's the same FZ100 batteries. The uh, power consumption, by the way, is slightly less. So in theory, the battery should last longer. So these are the key features of what the camera can actually do. Um, this is not new stuff. This is what the A7S III does, so I won't spend too long on this. So it's a full frame sense of 12.1 megapixels. What you will find, which is quite interesting, is when you look at the specs on the, um, on the Sony website, it will actually say 10.1 megapixels. And then when you look at the focus points, I can't remember the exact number, but it will be less than what the A7S III specs have. Now, the reason why it says a 10.1 megapixel um, sensor on the specs and the reason why it shows less autofocus points is because it's only showing you the specs for a 16 by nine portion of the sensor. So it's not counting the top and the bottom because it's a video central, well, it's not a video central camera, it's a video camera. It, even though it's got a still sensor, which is three by two, it is only giving you the specs of the 16 by nine parts. You cannot record the top and bottom anyway, only in stills. So that's why it's a 10.1 megapixels, but the sensor itself is the same as the A7S III. It's a 12.1 megapixel sensor. This is not an official spec. This is my opinion. It's a stunning image. Could you imagine if it's, maybe it does say that on the specs, but it, it is a stunning image. Uh, a long time ago, I talked about the color science. It has, has the Venice, uh, the right, it's not the same, exactly the same as Venice, but it has that same quality that the FX9 has. It matches with the FX9, the FX6, the A7S III. It's very beautiful. So it has S-Log3, um, which is very important if you want to capture the most dynamic range. So the dynamic range is, oh, I don't know where it is. It's on there somewhere. But the dynamic range is rated as, um, is quoted as 15 plus stops. It's not, it's 13 stops of usable dynamic range. So the way that, um, you, you know, you 15 plus stops is, you know, that you're looking at a, a dynamic range chart and you'll see a little bit of information in the shadows and a little bit of information in the highlights and on those extra two stops. But in reality, you have to chuck those away because it's not, they're not proper stops as in the, the information isn't fully retained in that. 13 stops are, so the, the one stop either side and in the, high, high, in the shadows and the highlights you don't count, but still very good. 13 stops, very good. Um, and s cinetone is there, but I'm shooting an s cinetone right now. And if you look at my FX3 video, everything of me is s cinetone. All the shots that I've I filmed, test shots I filmed were in s cinetone. Um, it's a baked in profile. So we don't, we don't have anything similar to that on the a7s3 we have things like cine profile stuff it's not like a cine profile it's it's um so if you if you know about tv standards and stuff we have rec 709 which is a broadcast standard so it's specific contrast and saturation etc um and i think the closest we would have on the a7s3 to that would be picture profile off and in standard and if you're in standard then it's pretty much rec 709 but you're going to lose dynamic range substantially with that and you can't grade it because it's so contrasty um but with s cinetone what is it's 
um, it's very much based on the S709 um, standard for cinema um, that Sony have done. It's a specific one for Sony, which is a much um, less contrasty, punchy image, really lovely and filmic. It's very much closer to that, but a little bit more contrasty. You can still um, work with it. It does lose two stops dynamic range, so it's 11, um, but it still does hold a fair amount of information. It looks beautiful and you can still pull up your shadows a fair amount and you still can bring your highlights back a bit. The key thing is to look at your, your histogram. And if you look at histogram and if you're not clipping, you know you can bring it back. If you know, you're shooting an S in a tone and you're like, you can see that you're clipping on your histogram. Um, if you look at my camera right now, so um, obviously so I'm clipping in the shadows there because it's there. So that, that I can't bring up much there. And you can see that I'm clipping right now um, on the, there we go, on the right, because it's, it's shunted over to there. So that's not recoverable. But if I, if I was in um, S, S log three, that would not be that I, I would be able to um, bring that back because my exposure settings would be much more forgiving. I wouldn't be overexposed at this point. The key thing is just use your histogram. That's your best friend. Don't look at the plus two, the ex and that's that, that stuff. It's still on the FX3. It still shows you that way of metering for stills. Don't use it. Use the histogram. Histogram will show you what you want. And when you are shooting in S log three, um, let me just go into S log three. So which I think is here. There we go. So there, as you can see right now, it's, it's you just got to be very good. Just about, just about holding your, there. as soon as we get a tight, you can see the solid line on the right hand side. We just want to lose that. Um, so anyway, there's the, that's S log three. That does require grading, um, but this, this lens is behaving strangely. There we go. So anyway, so the great thing about the camera is you can shoot S log three. You couldn't, prior to the S, uh, A7S three, no alpha camera should be, ever use S log three despite it having it because the eight bit codec is not strong enough to withstand it. Um, so with the firmware update, uh, hang on, we've got the questions there. Um, the A7S three is the Venice color science is the same. So uh, just did very simply to answer most of your questions about comparing the a7s3 to the fx3 everything about the way it operates the image the frame rates the codex everything is the same it's the same as the a7s3 the it, the differences that we have with the camera are, are pretty much all physical as in new body the handle buttons the fan the internals and the way everything else, the way it operates is the same as the A7S III. So that's the easiest way to think of it. Um, and that's not a bad thing because it is, the A7S III is a fantastic camera. So um, somebody's asking what the native ISO is. So when you are in, uh, let me go back to the camera here. So it's an interesting little factoid. So this is, um, let me go into S, S log three and let me turn off autofocus so it's not pulsing like that okay right so we're going to S log three you'll know what the native ISO is when you're in S log which is is it one there so you can see the ISO on the bottom right so it's got two lines uh, above, above and below which means it's extended ISO range it's not native so the lowest point we can go where that isn't got those two lines is 640 so that is your base iso in s log 3 it's different in different profiles in s cinetone you'll find that you can go lower than 640 and we still don't have those lines because in s cinetone your base iso is 100 just depends on the profile a lot of the profiles are very different. So I'm going to, um, I have no idea what some of these are. So that's the same. Um, I don't really use most of these. I tend to just use um, now S in a tone, but S log three. But a couple of them are, I think some of the Cine profiles will have a slightly higher um, base. I don't know what S log two is, but um, now one int very interesting 
feature, which um, is not official, but it is pretty much fact because I've tested it and tested it and tested it and tested it, is the camera is essentially dual ISO. It's not marketed as dual ISO. The only cameras that are of the cinema line are the FX9 and the Sony Venice. So um, there's a, the reason the FX6 originally was supposed to be called dual ISO. And the reason why they dropped it um, that I understand is the dynamic range shift that you, when you go, cause you go there's in the FX six, it works in a different way. You have, you can, you, you physically set your ISO to either low or high on the FX three and the A7S three, you don't have that. It's, it operates in a different way. If you want, you know, but the FX six, if you want to go, past say if you're in ss log three if you want to go past a certain points you can't unless you move it to the high iso setting so when it is in the high setting it loses about half a stop of dynamic range on the fx6 so when it when they saw that it did that they said well we can't call it dual iso because the whole point of dual iso for them is it's identical noise levels and dynamic range but it's still so the way the fx6 calls it is low and high so but it doesn't say base so it just says low and high the fx9 goes low base and high base because so, it is officially but the fx3 is still still does that um so the let me show the easiest way for me to do this it's, it's a good you know actually most of the sony cameras do this so you start with our base iso here um uh, I've actually got a video on YouTube about this, so you, you can see it really clearly. Um, we start at 100 ISO, so that is our low base. And if you go up, you can, you can either go up by 20 steps of these, or you can just count up by stops. So one stop, two stops, three stops. Hang on there, no, there's, there's, there's uh, sorry. Hang on, I've done, I, I can't even count, let's try, let's try again. So it's. 100 to 200 is one stop, 400 is two stops, 800 is three stops, 1600 is four stops. So now if you looked, if you recorded this black image and brought it up in your edit system by like, you know, a huge amount to see the noise, you'd see how noisy this image looks. You know, if you bring it up by like eight stops or something, you'd really see the noise. The key thing is, when you move to 2000, it instantly cleans up to practically looking like 100. So this in a, a cinetone. So in S-Log um, 3, it's 640. And then you count up four stops, which takes you to 10,000. So, and then it's noisy. And then if you move to 12,800, it cleans up. So those are the two stops. I think I'm gonna take off the, um, put the face tracking back on because it keeps focusing on my hand. Good, stop, because that's really annoying. Um, so, um, what, so when you're actually operating with the FX, same with all the cameras, the FX9, the FX6, uh, the FX3, the A7S3, is be very mindful of your ISOs. Um, if it's a lot of lights, then you're shooting at 100 and you're using ND. Uh, I've got ND on right now and you can control you know, your exposure with that. But if you are, um, if you start pumping up your ISO, you're introducing noise into the image. You know, 100 to 200 is fine. Pushing up another stop again is fine. But if you start pushing it up to say, um, I mean, I would not shoot in S in a tone of 1600. In S log three, I would not shoot in um, anything over 5,000 ISO. I would move to 12,800 and use, N if, it's, if it's too bright, then I use ND to bring it down because the noise levels drop massively. So it's a really important tip. Um, and the mathematics are very simple. If, you, if you're not sure of where that where it switches over, depending on your profile, just count four stops up, and then your next fraction 
is where it shifts up to the clean image. Now, a lot, a lot of people will say, nonsense, it's noise reduction. No, it's not noise reduction. There is noise reduction in this camera. So when you're shooting raw, whereas raw out of the HDMI, everything is turned off. You know, your, your artificial sharpening and your noise reduction, it's a pure image because that's the point of raw. And oh my God, it's noisy. If you go off of, you can only shoot in S-Log3 in RAW. Um, and if you go off of your base ISO of 640, um, you, you can, you'll see noise straight away. Just even going to um, you know, one stop up, you'll see noise because there's no noise reduction. The noise reduction circuits are, are very useful internally to a point, and I'll talk about that in a bit, but um, when you get to 12,800 when shooting raw, it instantly cleans up, which shows you that it's not noise reduction. It's a dual circuit on the analog digital circuit on the sensor. So really important to know that. So a lot of people think, oh, it isn't dual ISO. It is. You can, it's just not officially called that because it loses half a stop of dynamic range. So I just want to make sure you have that information. It's really important to have. It's a big feature of the camera that is not officially talked about because it, you know, it's not a dual sensitivity, but it is. So 10-bit uh, 422, so same as the A7S III. Um, this is really important for S-Log3. We need a 10-bit. 4K up to 120. Um, amazing autofocus. So um, yeah, the, I said the 120 does crop. The reason that the 120 crops is, so a lot of people, you know, you look at the sensor as a 12.1 megapixel sensor, right? And you, a lot of people say it's it's sampling one to one. So one to, sampling one to one means each pic, it's just taking the exact pixels and recording it. It's not doing that. The FX3 is not doing that. The A7S3 is not doing that. Because if you actually look at the specs of the sensor, the width is 4,240 pixels. So if it was sampling one to one, then it would mean that your image wouldn't be the whole sensor. It would be narrower, a tighter field of view. And it's not. If you take a photograph uh, of, and if you, and you take shooting video, you will see that it's the same field of view. Some of the Sony cameras do crop slightly when you go into video mode of the stills cameras. Some of them do. Um, but the FX, uh, the A7S III doesn't, and the, the FX3 doesn't. So what it does, it actually downsamples the 4,240 to 3840. Um, it's only a small downsample, but it, it does that. But in the 120p mode and 100p mode of 4K, it samples one to one because it's pro too processor intensive to downsample and record 100, 120 frames per second. It would overheat too much. And it's one of the reasons why the Canon R5 has such huge overheating problems is it's an 8K sensor and it's, um, you know, if you go into 4K 120p, it's got to do a lot of work to actually keep that full width and record it because, you know, 8K is whatever, it's 30 something megapixels, but HD is 10 megapixels, uh, is 4K is 10 megapixels. So it's got to do a lot of processing, to bring it down, which generates a lot of heat. And that's why that camera overheats so much. And to avoid overheating on the A7S III, they simply crop the sensor slightly. Um, by 10%. There's not a massive amount. So it's one of the things it does in 100p and 120p. Everything else is full width. Um, full size HMO, 16 bit raw out. Uh, actually, what's interesting about the raw out is um, it does record the whole sensor. Not the whole sensor, but the whole width, pixel wise. So because it's raw, it's doesn't you can't record a down sampled raw image it doesn't work that way um the uh, it, it's uh, it has to take the pixels everything that's there so we could either tell the camera okay just sample 3840 by 2160 but then your raw would be cropped so it does actually record 4240 width in prores raw so whilst this does not have dci 4k which is 4096 by 2160 it's 3840 by 2160. You can get DCI 4K if you shoot in RAW. But in fact, you get more, you get a bigger width 
Um, so, and the height is more than 2160, but I can't know exactly what it is. So it's, um, I mean, I talk about the advantages of RAW in a little bit. It's, it's not for everything, but it's certainly a nice feature. Talks about dynamic range. Uh, yeah, it's a fully articulating touch screen. Um, you know, there's, there's definitely arguments for, for having both. If you are shooting with the camera dead in front of you, having a just a simple tilting screen is really nice because you are basically, it's right in front of you. Um, and that's the only downside of a flip screen is the fact is when you, um, if you want it at an angle, if you want this, the flip screen, um, you want it like that, then you can, let me take out the HMI so you can see that it is. Right, so, you know, if you want to operate like, you know, right in front of you, it has to be folded in. The moment you want to tilt it, you have to take it out and you have to um, angle it. So that way you are basically looking at the screen slightly off. So that's the downside of a, um, a, a flip out screen. Um, it'll be nice if it does both, but I definitely find a flip screen is, is very useful when shooting video because you know, when you're shooting on a tripod, um, your heart, how often are you going to be exactly the same? You know, you, you're going to be slightly off or, you know, it's doing some low shots, doing some high shots and maybe slightly to the front side, to the side. The articulating screen is, is very, very useful. And I've been wanting it on the Sony stills cameras for ages and FX6 and FX9, of course, they, 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 they do that anyway, because it's, it's, it's not, it's not fit. The screens aren't physically attached to the body permanently. You can unscrew them and you can turn them to it however you want them to be. So let's go back on to here. Um, IBIS um, with active mode. So should we, we most of you should know what IBIS is. Um, image stabilized sensor. So right now you can see uh, I'm wobbling my desk and you're not seeing it, you're not really seeing anything. Like, can you see any wobble? So I have IBIS um, uh, on right now because I have my camera is set up on a, a monitor arm attached to the table. So if I have IBIS turned off, so I'm actually in active mode because it gives me the strongest and I'm going to turn it completely off. So there you are, that's with IBIS off. And so every time I'm pressing the computer, my whole camera moves. So let's just put it in normal IBIS mode. You can see the movement of the behind of the, the, um, the, the shadows, but the actual image. So you can see that it, it's a really useful thing to have IBIS, even just on a, a tripod. If there's any movement, it really takes it away. The active mode, as you can see, crops. Boom. So it crops 10%. And what it's doing is it's not, it's not like the 100p and 120p, it's not something one time. What it's doing is it is um, it's taking that sensor and reducing the the um, size of it. It's it's upscaling, so it's reducing by 10%. So you'd think, oh, so it's it's not um, full UHD anymore. It is because it it simply upscales it a bit like clear image zoom. Um, and what it's doing is using that 10%, so the IBIS can work better because the, the, sensor can only, the sensor can only move so much. So if you've got big movement, then there's not much it can do. But if you've got, it, by having an extra 10% border around the edge of the sensor, it can use that and to make the, the, the image much better. And it does work really well. It's not a replacement for a gimbal or anything like that, but it's, it's, it's I use IBIS a lot, IBIS with active mode a lot. It doesn't work in 100 and 120p mode because of that one-to-one -one sampling and et cetera. So it can't, it can't crop it down, but there you go. So IBIS with, act, um, that's the active mode. I really love it. And I think that's the, you know, a lot of people saying, oh, I'd rather have variable ND than active, than IBIS. And I'm like, you know what? I understand that argument. Oh, but, but my cat bird's coming over. That's Percy. Um, the problem is, is that I can, the autofocus does not work on animals, which is what I'm hoping it will do. To hide my face, you'll be all right. <laughs> my person. Um, 
what was I saying? The oh yeah, it's of ND. So I have ND on the front of the cap on the lens. It's a variable ND isn't ideal because it does change the color slightly the more the stronger you put it in there because it's using polarizers. But you could use fixed NDs and then it's a, so but I can't but stabilizing handheld um, is is much harder. So you know if you like, oh I'd rather have a variable ND, I can put it on a I'd rather have Oberlin internally and have and put it on a gimbal. I would say to them, a gimbal is not the same as shooting handheld. It's a different look, it's a different style. If you want to shoot handheld without IBIS, then the longer the lens you have, the shakier it's going to be. So I'd rather it was more stable and I use ND on the lens. So that's what I believe anyway. Um, you're off then, Percy. All right. So. Yeah, so what was I saying? Um, the readout of the sensor actually is very, very good. So that is the one advantage, if you, um, big advantage over the previous models is the rolling shutter is very minimal on the FX3 and the 7 s 3 It's so, so good. It's not quite global shutter performance, but you, to get it to skew, you'd have to be on a, a long lens and moving really quickly. So I remember um, the first time I used a DSLR with video in 2008, Nikon D90. Oh my God. Um, I had never seen anything like this because I'd been using global shutter cameras and I had an EX1 and EX3, which were CMOS sensors, which use rolling shutters, but they're pretty good because you know, they're only a half inch sensor. So the readout works well and I, you don't really have those issues. And I was filming. Um, I, was, I was filming out in Richmond, where I live, and I was sh shooting my my favourite bridge with the trains going over it. And these trains, you know, they're not aerodynamic; they're vertical. But suddenly, it was like whoa, super aerodynamic as it went through the frame because the rolling shutter was so so bad on that camera. And what the A7S3 FX3, the readout is so good that it's. Um, it reduces that. And it's not just that, it also gets rid of micro jitters. But again, the, act, the, the IBIS really helps as well. So having a fast sensor readout. Excuse me, I think you dropped your microphone. Oh. I, did, I recorded my, I did a whole video talking about um, to focus because I'm making a, a long video and I was talking for like two hours and I finished filming and then I saw that the microphone was on the table. <laughs> wow, well, how can you imagine how annoyed I was? Um, Thanks. that's because better now, thank you. Because when you're filming yourself, you don't have headphones in, so you don't know. Um, and you're not looking at the screen at levels because that looks like you know, you've got to look at the camera. So, thank you for letting me know. It's one of those things. I need to clip it on, I'm gonna clip onto my jacket. I'm actually using the, um, let me show you. You can bring my ISO down a bit because it's crazy high. Wrong camera. All right, I'm actually using the uh, UWPD um, wireless. Hang on, let me just take off autofocus there. So that is wireless system plugs directly into your um, MI shoe and it, so there's no cables going into it and I'm using the receiver. Um, actually, let me go back onto this, which is, which is here. So there we go. So it's a nice solution for audio. Uh, it's only one channel right now, but for the digital system, there is an analog system, which is dual channel, if you want to use that. So I don't know where I got to, but um, there's a couple of questions. Um, Remote control possibility, yes. Um, there's a really nice Bluetooth remote um, which you can buy, um, and I use it. It's actually I don't have one in here. It's in it's in my other room, and what I really like about it is it's got a red tally light on it. So when you hit record, it shows that you're recording on your remote control. It's it has uh, two of the uh, has C1 and C2 shortcut buttons on it. Um, it has a zoom on it as well, and you can also use it for stills. It's got a mode to flick between. Oh, you can use it for focus. So the zoom rocker um, 
can be used for zoom and then you've got a switch on the side which turns it into focus so if you want to shoot um you can change your focus um with that um in manual focus mode so you can go manual focus mode not physically on the dial but on electronically switched on the camera and then you can change the focus yourself on that so the remote control i don't know what it's called so i'm sure somebody will put it into the link it's great um the can a camera record and start by HDMI to an external recorder? Yes, 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 yes. It absolutely can. It's you just set, um, yeah, it, it will do that absolutely fine, um, as they most have. Any other questions there? So, yeah, a question about IBIS compared to, to the metadata stabilization. Okay, so there is one thing that you could use, you know, if say we got rid of, and this is with the FX6, the FX6 has no IBIS, but it does have variable ND. So you do have that issue of, um, of stabilizing it handheld. So I'm not a big fan of holding a camera low, which I've mentioned before. And you tend to do that with the FX6 as well. So I'm now, I have a rig for my FX6 that goes on my shoulder. So it's, it's stable. The heavier camera you get, the more stable it is. And it's simply a fact. If you've, if you've ever shot with a, a proper video camera, you know, or like an Alexa or, or a Venice and put it on your shoulder, your handheld is going to be way better than a small camera that's not on your shoulder. The, the weight is really helpful. So I, I have it on my shoulder and it's really nice. Um, but what you can do, there's, there's two, two options if you don't have IBIS. Um, obviously, an optical stabilized lens is, is a very useful thing. But you don't, the only prime lens that I know of in Sony E mount system with um, OIS is the Zeiss Batis 85 millimeter. I um, oh, and the 90 mil macro. I can't think of any other IBIS primes. They're on zooms. Um, so that, that, those, I do use um, optical stabilization because it is great and it works really well in combination with the IBIS. If you don't have optical stabilization, you do have another option. So what this camera also records is the movement of the camera using a gyroscope that is inside the camera. Um, so it literally knows, it will record data onto each clip of how much it is actually moving. And it uses that data uh, in a software called Catalyst Browse. And so when we use trying to stabilize stuff normally in you know, DaVinci Resolve, Final Cut Pro, Premiere, what it does is it analyzes the image and it tries to work out how to stabilize it. With gyroscopic data, it doesn't do that. It knows how much the image is moved because it, the camera's recorded that data and you're able to stabilize things really well. Not perfectly. The reason you can't be perfectly is because say you're walking with somebody, uh, you're doing a walking shot and not on a gimbal, you're walking with somebody. What's going to naturally happen with you, with your the way you walk with your footsteps, is you're going to go up and down a little bit. So the camera is going to be moving slightly up and down. So what happens is the background will be slightly changed as you're doing that. Any anything that you're trying to stabilize that has a subject in the foreground, any post stabilization cannot make it like a gimbal because the background is changing. If you have a bland background, like completely, you know, that's where shallow depth of field can really help. And if you're on a, you know, don't have such a prominent subject, then it can work really well. So Catalyst Browse does work really well. The biggest downside is you have to make a choice. Um, you, have to, you have to turn off IBIS and you have to turn off optical stabilization where it doesn't work. It, it will, it will have it in there. So when you go into the software, it has a little symbol showing you what can be stabilized. 100p and 120p, 200p, 240p in HD cannot be stabilized no matter what with Catalyst Browse. IBIS works, but you can't, it doesn't, the gyroscope doesn't work. So, um, uh, well, I was saying, so what was I saying? I completely lost my train of thought. So, yeah, okay. So the, for me, the biggest downside is you have to shoot in a higher shutter speed. If you don't, if you shoot at the correct shutter speed and you put it through the software, then you get your edges aren't as good. So 
I think it's so if you you know if you're shooting at 25p, you're shooting at 50th of a second, and if you're planning to use Catalyst Browse, and you're going to do some heavy stabilization with it, you really need to be at like at least 200th of a second, which isn't ideal. Now you can of course add motion blur in post, but it's not going to be quite the same. The only time I really use Catalyst Browse is when I'm on a tripod and I, there's a little bit of shake maybe from operator and stuff and I can completely remove that from there as long as I haven't got IBIS turned on. So it is a choice you physically have to make. If you've used you know, things like GoPros uh, and stuff like that, they have the same technology of gyroscopic data, but it does a stabilizing as it's recording. You don't need to do it in post. Whereas you take something like an Insta360 camera, and they do action cameras as well, they record all that data, but they do it in post. They don't record it, so it's which is quite an interesting decision to do that. But GoPros do it as you're recording. So, and the um, the Catalyst Browse also can do it in post. The one, the other really interesting thing about Catalyst Browse and using it is you can make it more steady by cropping in more you loot the more resolution you use the more stable it can make it because if you think about it if the the, sh the the shot if my shot is moving quite a lot it can only take the bit which is in the middle to stabilize because it can't stabilize anything that's out of the frame so if you want that shot to be really stable you've got to lose anything that's not in that center bit if that makes sense so the more wobbly it is and the more stable you want it to be, the more you have to crop in on the Catalyst Browse. It's all, it's it's a good function, but I would prefer I, I do prefer IBIS. I would really love it if they could do both, but the gyroscope is measuring the, how much the camera is moving, and it cannot it doesn't know how much the IBIS is moving as well. That's the problem. And an optical stabilized lens, it doesn't know how much that lens is stabilizing inside there because it's not electronic. So that's why it doesn't work. So it has to be turned off. Um, does the wireless work? Yeah, the effect. So the wireless is um, sure. the wireless is it's the it's the MI shoe. Any camera with an MI shoe can use the wireless system. Um, the wireless accessories are great. So this is another really good one. Uh, so this is when I first saw this uh, at a uh, in, in the old days when we used to go to launch events for new products, I can't remember the last one that was, I missed those. So I saw this and thought, why have they made a strange handle for the camera? And it's not, it's a microphone. So this is the B, uh, I think it's the full name, but it's the B1M. Full name is so small, I need a magnifying glass. ECM, B1M. So all the microphones are called ECM. Um, electro condenser microphone. So this is an MI shoe microphone that you can put on the top of the FX3, A7S3, any camera from Sony with an MI shoe connector. And there's no cables because it's an MI shoe. And the really cool feature, two really cool features about this. So on here, you will see that we have, um, let me try and make it so my light, there's no, no light there. So we have three different polar patterns which we can switch between. So we go from shotgun to um, cardioid to omnidirectional. So, um, which basically means when it's in shotgun mode, it's gonna pick up there. If it's in cardioid mode, it's gonna pick up like there. Uh, so more like there, still rejecting a lot from the front. Omnidirectional mode means it's like a wild, it's like a lav mic. It's gonna pick, three, pick up 360. So if you have this set, to the circle setting on there, which is omnidirectional. So even though the camera's put, the mic's pointing to the front, it's still gonna, if you talk, it'll still hear you. It just means that it won't be very good for anybody in the front who is further away. So if you want to film somebody who's gonna be in front talking, I wouldn't recommend this anyway, it's just a B-roll, but it's a really nice mic. I just wouldn't recommend it for dialogue, I'd recommend the proper mic. And the other cool feature is it has noise reduction on it. Now, um, I would only, that's Percy. Um, it has noise reduction. And the reason when you'd use noise reduction is not normally, but say you're doing some filming in a car on a plane, it will really make your audio so much better. 
or in an office with lots of whirring computers, you can, and if you, you can probably hear, it just doesn't have noise cancelling on. If I was using this and it was pointed right at me with noise cancellation on, it would be a lot cleaner. So great accessory that. Um, I think we're at the end of the thingy. Yeah, so it's great AMD camera. And you can see the difference between the FX6 and the FX3 here. Um, and part, you know, you can look at the difference in the height of the two cameras. You know, the variable ND mechanism is a fairly substantial thing inside that camera. And yeah, it's got a lot, um, you know, this is why the camera doesn't have SDI and time code and et cetera, et cetera, because look at the size of it. It's so much more. And this doesn't have um, the, the FX6, FX6's audio connections are all on the handle, which isn't in that, in that uh, video. And there's no side grip on there either right now. So that's at its utter, utter minimum right there. You can just see just the size difference is enormous. Question about matte color matching. So yeah, I mentioned it before that um, these ca the FX3, the A7S3, the FX3, the FX6, FX9 are beautiful, work so well together, hence great A, B camera, because you just put them in S-Log3. Um, the most important thing, apart from you putting in your profiles, is simply manual white balancing. As long as you manual white balance on all of your cameras, so white card, gray card, whatever, the same one on each camera, and you're in the same profile, then they'll match perfectly, pretty much perfectly. You might see all, maybe I need to adjust my magenta by the tiny shit, tiniest, tiniest amount. Uh, and the only reason that can tend to happen is the FX6 and FX9 don't white balance as well as the um, FX3. Let me show you what I mean. So, uh, 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 where is it? So you can see I've got a white over there, right? Okay, let me just go on to autofocus there. Right, so there's my white. Now, an FX6 and FX9 would require that white over there to entirely fill the frame to actually be accurate. So I am going to correct my white balance, although it's going to be wrong for... I'm in daylight white now, but it's not daylight over there, but I'm going to change it. And you go into manual white balance, go to set, you can see a little box. So you only have to have the white in that box, not the whole frame, which is wonderful. Boom, there we go. We now have correct white balance in there. Oh, my battery's quite low in them. So that's what that's, I wish the FX6 and FX9 had that because I love that, you know, that's, it's really important because if you do not fill the frame of your FX6 or FX9 with your white card, then your white balance won't be accurate. So you need to take it. Because I normally use have a really small uh, color checker passport from x right which goes in your pocket. And you can't fill the frame of an FX6, FX9 with that, not unless you've got a macro lens, but you can with these selectable ones. So was there anything else on the actual slides? Uh, I'm not going to talk about that because any questions are there. Um, raw, what are we doing on time? Okay, this, this is the last thing I really wanted to talk about. Um, so it does record, you can record raw, as I mentioned before, and if you... Um, and if you can see it on that slide, can you see it? Uh, no, I don't think so. So it records, I say, the, the full width, and it's a 16-bit signal, but it, it's not recording in 16-bit, it's recording in 12-bit um, ProRes RAW, and you'll see no difference in quality. And it's, ProRes RAW is a great format um, because what it does is it records in its compressed RAW, and it's the size of the file. So I, I'm in ProRes normal, ProRes RAW here, not ProRes HQ. So ProRes RAW, there isn't an actual bit rate because it's totally variable, but it roughly equates to the same as ProRes HQ. So it's not massively massive files. And you get, the, I mean, the reason why you'd want to shoot ProRes RAW is to just avoid any image processing from the camera and do it all yourself in post. Um, depending on what software you can use, you can change your ISO, change your, well, you wouldn't want to, but you can change your ISO, but you can change your white balance, add noise reduction, et cetera, et cetera. And the key thing is, is also sharpening as well, because the, you can't turn sharpening off. You can put it to minus seven on the FX3, but you can't completely turn it off. It's 
minus seven is, is fine to be honest with you, but on the FX6 and FX9, you can completely turn it off. And it's the same with noise reduction. You cannot turn off noise reduction fully in on the internal recording on the FX3. So, but you can in RAW. And the reason why you'd want to do that is really for high ISO stuff. I would always recommend shooting at your two base ISOs, a 640, 12,800 as much as possible. Um, you can, as I say, you can go up a little bit, but then you're just going to just know that you are introducing noise. And the downside of the FX3, same with the A7S3, is if you really push your ISO up really high and you're underexposed, then you really will see some quite ugly artifacts because it, it's, the noise reduction really kicks in and it does it too much. It's too much. So you get lots of artifacts. Whereas when you're shooting a ProRes RAW, um, you, you actually have fantastic results. So this was from the launch video for the A7S III. And I had to go back and do some pickup shots because I shot all my high ISO stuff. So I, I did a video called Now I See in 2014 using the original A7S. And it was me just trying to see how much, how bright you could see. And I turned night into day with, with, in that video. And there was a lot of heavy noise reduction in it. And I added some film grain and stuff and hit it quite well. And it was HD. So it didn't look so bad. But the problem is because it's 4K, if you're using that really heavy noise reduction and it's really dark, you are going to see a lot of artifacts. So if you look at, you're not really going to see it on Zoom, but um, let's go on to the next slide. Oh, actually, I don't have it, um, but it's it's in my um, it's in my FX3 review, and you can see it. And so while you can go up to four hundred nine thousand six hundred in your extended ISO of this camera, and it's gonna it's gonna be you know it's going to be noisy no matter what. And the noise looks awful when you're shooting in ProRes RAW. I mean, it looks really, really bad. Way worse than the internal recording. But the key thing is, it the detail is still there. You've just got this massive amount of chroma noise and luminance noise over your image, but the detail is still there. Whereas the noise reduction internal recording you've lost the detail. It's made it all mushy around the, all your detail was gone. And if you use something like neat video, post-production um, noise reduction software, you can get fantastic results that you could never get internally because you can do fine control of exactly how much you want to do it. So that's one of the biggest advantages of ProRes, or not just for shooting at super high ISOs, but just controlling that noise reduction. I think it's one of the things that, not one of my cats, Bert's. Um, <laughs> I shut them out yesterday because I knew they're, there's, there's Bert. Hi, Bert. Um, there's one of the things I, I would, I really hope that they will bring into new firmware for this camera is noise reduction to be able to turn it off. Because you can in stills, you just can't in video. So when you're in the stills menu, you will see that noise reduction is um, in there because you do have two different menus uh, depending on what mode you're in. So these are the new menus and they're terrific. Um, if you go into the stills menu, you'll see, my battery shouldn't die. Um, so in the stills menu, this is the, F, this, the menu's the same as the FX3. Uh, I can't remember where it is. It's in here somewhere. There is a noise reduction Oh yeah, so this is the zoom speed that you have for your clear image zoom and stuff. There. So you will see that there is, um, I can't find, I don't know where it is. It's in there somewhere, noise reduction. It's in there somewhere in the stills mode, but in the video mode, it isn't. So when you, these new menus are fantastic. So if you look really closely, so we look at, we have, we have our, our main sections on the left-hand side. I've actually programmed six complete um, pages of my options that I want. So you can have, I don't know how many, you can have loads. These are all fantastic, but what I've done with the My Menus is I have just put all the key things that I want, that I use, the most, absolutely most important ones for quick access. So I have all of my, re, my um, record settings in there. And one of the things I have in there 
is NTSC PAL. So if you want to shoot in 24p or you want to shoot in 60p, you want to shoot 120p, and you're in PAL, you can't. You have to switch to NTSC. Unlike other earlier cameras from Sony, prior to the A7S III, uh, you don't need to format the card each time you change, which is what they did, which is awful. This doesn't do it. So, but normally that is all the way down here, which is miles away from all your other movie settings. So I just simply put it in there. So I have all of these, uh, these are my profile, picture profile settings, my, all of my autofocus settings. So whilst there is an autofocus sub menu, all of the touch operation ones are again down in the bottom there. So you'll find that it's, you know, you can make your, the menus better by this. The only thing I would love to be able to do is to label the my menus with a specific name. But so all of my audio, there's no sub audio setting, so sub mini for audio setting, but there is, you can create your own. So I love all these and we can see our different codecs here. The one you want to record in as much as possible is XAVCSI. It's an interframe codec. Each, um, each frame is individually compressed, so it's not long GOP. It does require a bit more space, but it's worth it because you don't need to transcode it in post. You can edit it natively. Um, you can use this, your B90 cards for this, um, for normal 25p um, and 50p, I think. I um, can't remember, but you can change the frame rate here. Yeah, so our bit rate is 500 megabits a second in 50p. Normally, it is 250 megabits a second. Now, if we compare that to the old format of XAVCS, which we still have. Um, so if we, the, the one we had in the A7S II and all the other cameras was this, 100 megabits a second, 4208 bit. So it's a slight, slight increase now um, in the XAVCS. Um, but the most compressed or the most efficient is actually HS. But the annoying thing is HS does not have anything lower than 50p straight. I do not know why. It's really weird, especially as the A1, which records in 8K in 24, 25 or 30p, only records in HS, which makes it really efficient. Um, I don't know why it does this. It does 30p in PAL mode, but not 24. But you can say so if we look at the, the bit rate of XAVCS, um, hang on, let's go to it. Um, XAVCS 4K at 50p was double, wasn't it? So it's 500 megabits a second. But in XAVCS, XAVCHS in 50, it's 100. And that is a massive amount of data saving. And there is no image difference, none at all, between that mode and XAVCS um, I. And you are using up. Um, five times more data more space on your card by shooting in i the thing is you if you're going to shoot in this mode you cannot edit this natively you will if you try you are going to cry and you are going to go mad because you, you put a transition it probably won't even play in your edit system it is so compressed so cleverly compressed it has to be transcoded into prores and then ProRes um, 4K 50p, ProRes 42 4K 50p is about 600 megabytes, uh, megabits a second, which is more than XAVC SI 4K 50p. So that makes sense. So whilst you're recording, you're saving space on the, the cards uh, whilst you're recording. But when it comes to actually working off your hard drives, you're actually going to end up using up more hard drive space by shooting in XAVC HS because you've got to convert it into ProRes and those ProRes files are bigger than the XAVC i 4K. This is this, whilst it's, it's, it's an MP4 wrapper, <clears throat> these are the same bit rates as you'll get on the FX6, FX9 with the XAVC i it's called. So those are MXF wrappers, but they're the same same compression ratios, same quality, can edit them beautifully natively. So this is why I recommend it. The downside is you do need to, uh, to have more cards, um, 
but the time that you it depends how quickly you need to edit something um you know certainly like with the 8k of the a1 which is a bit more of an extreme example but even with the hs actually you you can't edit until it's transcoded and it takes a while to transcode it um it, especially the 422 version of it which is or currently it is it'll it eventually will change but right now if you go in if you record in the 422 10 bit then pretty much all modern graphics cards cannot decode it so you have to use the cpu so it's really slow but if you drop down to 420 the graphics cards can decode it and you're only losing um color in um, um compression there and you won't unless you're doing any green screen or really heavy heavy grading you will not see a difference so you can record in super high quality at just 75 megabits a second in um hs which is kind of crazy for 50p so, so if that if it did do 25p it would be 50 megabits a second which is crazy when you think about it isn't it so the reason i'm saying currently is that um the computer that i'm actually using right now um can i i can't show you right anyway it's i'm using a the macbook pro m1 chip inside it so it's the apple silicon and in final cut pro you can edit the native files of hs you don't need to transcode it it's crazy the and it doesn't even have a dedicated this is doesn't even have a dedicated graphics card it's an integrated graphics card integrated graphics chip inside it and it's cheap it's a cheap computer um so it shows you App, apple are, are really making huge strides with with computer technology um davinci resolve have a beta version of for the apple silicon computers which um which take advantage of the increased speed and there is a beta premiere which is rubbish um doesn't work very well with it yet final cut does i don't like final cut but it can edit them natively so there is a win-win situation so when the apple start um bringing out their bigger computers which will be even more powerful You'll be able to edit, you'll be able to shoot in these crazy compressed formats, which have no image quality drop out, drop, and have these small files and not have to have bloated hard drives. I have my hard drives, I have so many terabytes connected to my edit computer. It's ridiculous. I mean, my FX3 review uh, was eight terabytes, um, which is a lot. Uh, a lot of it was transcoding um, of stuff. Uh, all, everything that shot on camera was in 8K with the, uh, the Alpha 1, so that I had to transcode, which created huge files. So um, going back to means we don't have much longer, so I just want to quickly, if there's any other questions. Um, somebody's saying, stop using MacBook Pros and start using Mac Pros. Yeah, you don't need to just use it. Even your MacBook Air, the new M1 MacBook Air, outperforms my iMac Pro, which is kind of crazy. Um, I'm, so I'm doing a dedicated video on autofocus and how important these settings are. They're hugely, hugely, hugely important. Um, actually, let me go back onto this. So if we look at, um, so right now we are in, I'm not going to go through everything. So our focus area is wide and you can obviously change it to whatever you want it to be. Right. Okay. And these are the key things, and it really is dependent on the, the lens you're on. So I'm on a 35 1.4 GM, which is a super fast motor. So you've got to be really careful about this setting here, speed. And you've also got to be really careful about the subject shift, this. So if we are on uh, maximum speed and maximum sensitivity, it will basically be, you can see the lens breathes quite, quite a lot. Hang on, is it going to? there all right so that is it's unnatural when you have it that fast anyway so we could drop our speed down to one it'll still react fast but it'll be a slower pull much more natural okay but what if we don't want anything to interfere so we would drop down to one which is locked on and even if i go into the fast speed which you would never want to go fast speed on this lens. You can see, once it's locked onto a subject, which is that, 
it will not change. Now, if I hold it in there for long enough, it will eventually change. Take a while, but it will eventually go on to it. It will take a long time to do it. So the more you increase this, the more um, that will happen. So now if I put it at three, then if I go slowly across, it will go onto my hand. But if I go, let, let it go on there. If I go fast across, it won't. But you saw how, how badly it reacted really quite slowly, didn't it? So that is awful. So I tend to use basically five and one and very rarely anything in the middle. And that's why I have shortcut buttons on the camera that let me, or I use the, the shortcut menu here to change it. So whilst um, what you'll find is it really is totally camera depend, lens dependent. So as I said, a 35 has a crazy fast motor, um, but um, other lenses, so my, I'm on a 35 1.8 in here right on me right now. This is the perfect autofocus lens that I found. The settings are totally perfect and um the way you if you're at one it's nice and smooth and slow the perfect amount of slow and then the increments work really well together so and also this lens as you can see unlike that gm doesn't breathe you can see look at the background as, as it goes it's just keep it there's no breathing on it it's an amazing lens and it's cheap 35 1.8 Sony, it's my favorite 35 mil lens. So, I mean, autofocus is a massive topic. And I don't want, I can't go into it too deeply, um, but it is really important um, to understand how to get the best from it. So I, I'm, and I think I need, need to wrap up because we've got like, I think we've only got a set time on Zoom. So I just want to just see if there's anything else on here I wanted to quickly show you. Um, Oh yeah, with the different cards, if you do end, if you want to record proxies, which is a good way of editing, if you want, um, you will need the faster cards because it needs to write two separate files. So all these settings you can save to an SD card, which is really good. Um, so if you want to transfer it to different cameras um, under file, just remember it's it's it does save in in the computer's uh, sorry, in the camera's memory, but um, it saves the file to an, an SD card. Um, and I think there's anything else I wanted to quickly show you on there. There's so much to go through about this. Um, no, not really. All the customized settings there. I'd say it is a stills camera as well. What's quite nice is you can actually um, have different settings depending on what mode you're in. So at the moment, everything... Um, when I switch to stills from video, keeps the same aperture, keeps the same shutter speed, keeps the same ISO. But for example, if you want to shoot video, you tend to want to shoot at, for 25p at 50 of a second. So maybe you'd keep your shutter speed to stay the same when you're in video. Um, and then when you get stills, it's whatever the stills mode was. So, and also for picture profile, for example, this, was, this is definitely a key thing if you're going to shoot in S-Log3 and you want to use JPEGs, for stills, because if you switch to stills mode, it will be S-Log3 JPEGs, which are awful. So you can click on that and you have an independent profile. Anyway, there you go. I think there's so much I could talk about, but um, if I think we just need to wrap up with any last questions. Um, if you want, basically, if you want to record in, a, in XAV CSI and 25P and you want to record proxies, you've got to use these. Um, it really depends on the codec. I so say once we get, this is going to hide my face because it's on the face again. If we, once we, um, once we get fast computers or computers like these silicons, which can deal with H.265 encoding, HEVC encoding, which is what the HS is, then you probably won't need these much. You, you could just shoot with V30 and V60 cards. But I mean, right now I use Angelbird, I use um, uh, ProGrade cards as well. Um, I need. To, I'd, I'd like to get some of the uh, Sony Tough cards. They are more money, but V90 V90 cards aren't that expensive, so I would really do recommend them because you've got more options for your formats. And if you and if you've got and if you're rich, then buy like a hundred of these maybe 200 and then give each of us like 10 because that would be great 
because I love these cards. They offload so fast. Wow, Philip, thank you. It has been really been really been uh, uh, interesting hours. <laughs> <laughs> the time is flying, really, yes. but it, it's so much interesting to to get the learning and uh, to understand. So you have done a really, really good job. And uh... it's a it's a it's a ten hour it's a ten hour course to actually go through and teach you how to use this camera fully. Really, <laughs> so... it is it is. But it also, I, I hope that this will give inspiration for for all our friends around the Nordic countries and. Um, to to get uh, to our stores and uh, maybe try the the, the camera, and uh, as far as I know, that we will get deliveries from Sony of this new FX3 in mid uh, March, so uh, around two weeks ago. Uh, wait, so um, so it's very very close. So I hope that. Uh, uh, you guys who are, are really interesting that you place your orders and don't forget the the lens bundles we have three three hundred uh, three thousand Swedish crowns or Norwegian crowns uh, discount on each lens. It's really really good. As you said, the the G Master lens is let's just say really really good, Philip. So um, I no thank you very much, Philip. I, I really appreciate this time and I hope that okay. we can see you live in in a near future f future yes i'd love to come back um yeah i was supposed to come back uh, end of last year so september october but of course that got cancelled so yeah yeah exactly and um so i don't see any more uh, uh questions so i think we have wrap it up uh, yeah, right now it, if yeah. there are any more questions you want to ask i'm very accessible on social media so just you know tweet me instagram me whatever ask a question on the youtube review uh, watch youtube video because it does cover a fair bit and also the a7s3 review which covers so much because it's a longer video and because the fx3 has so much from that camera i didn't cover everything like i could have done yeah i repeat myself so lots of there's two great videos for you to watch on there as well It'll give you more information okay thank you very much well, and uh, and let's hope that we see each other soon again. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Bye. Thank you very much, Philip. And have a nice weekend. Thank you. Bye. Bye.